Folks, this is a series that I hope you enjoy as much as I do. This is where we get somebody, Millennial Mike, that goes through the comments, pulls out the spicy, pulls out the good that need a deeper analysis, and quite frankly, ones that he just wants to see me react to. I cannot believe we have such a nice person that does this every week for us here. So we all owe him a debt of gratitude and a thanks. I know I do. Mike, what do you got this week? Oh, yeah, we got some great topics this week. We got more follow-up questions on seller financing. We did a few videos on that. Um, of course, people are always asking about the crash. You did some videos with Jason Hartman. That was super cool. Big shout out. If you haven't watched those, watch him. He's a real estate superstar. Um, jobs reports, revisions, all these different topics out there. So we're going to start with you and Jason Hartman. We're discussing the real estate crash. Um, and at Picture Works Denver says there's plenty of people who bought in 2007 at the top of the last cycle and found themselves deeply underwater in their homes. I know people who had to bring cash to the table when they sold their houses, so it can go both ways. 40% to 50% price appreciation in a couple years isn't normal. So it's understandable that people are wary of jumping in and they're looking for a reversion to the mean in home prices. In my area, prices have doubled. Inventory is now almost non-existent, but sales have ground to a halt. The market is frozen. Eventually, the 30% contraction in real estate will have a profound knock on effects in the broader economy. So he's calling for a 30% crash and he wants to know what type of effect the real estate market's having on the broader economy. So, Mike, what do you think? So, um, I guess I haven't seen this question yet, so that's, that's pretty cool. So, there's a couple of things that I would react to that. Uh, first, I believe, it, it should be obvious now, a 30% crash in real estate uh, in the next couple of years is highly unlikely. Um, I think this individual, like a lot of the crash bros, are like, hey, it happened before, it can happen again. Okay, but let's talk about why it happened. And again, we had 50% of loans for 2005 and six that are adjustable rate mortgage, a large proportion of those. Let me just say this, a large pro proportion of those loans that were written then are illegal now. Illegal, they were so bad, right? Nagam loans and things of that, teaser loans. So what happened in the crash last time, folks, is homeowners could afford the payment at the teaser rate. And then at some event, it skyrocketed and then homes were unaffordable. When things are unaffordable, you sell. Mm -hmm. And they sold in mass and supply greatly uh, exceeded demand. Because not only did supply exceed demand, but what also happened is banks pulled back. Banks said investors were the problem and you could only get four home loans. So not only did we have the supply problem, but we also had demand greatly restricted. So now let's go to later comment. He says, we have to have a housing crash because there's no inventory and there's no transactions. Well, I'm not sure how that happens, but okay. But let's talk about what today is not like before. The effective interest rate. An effective interest main rate means put all the mortgages together, get an average is 3.6%. This is affordable. Jason Hartman, in the video this gentleman references, talks about people affording their payments on unemployment. So we're not going to get the wave of supply. I mean, I don't know what you guys need to understand. Now, is it fair? I don't give a rat's ass. This ain't about being fair. And reversion to the mean, well, that's possible, I guess. But the other thing that's really possible is we grind sideways for a decade, like I am calling for. And, oh, by the way, Bruce Norris, who has a track record of California crash, California comeback, and some great housing calls, also now, I understand, is calling for a sideways market of five to eight years. So everybody wants to crash because it happened last time. You want to sit on the sidelines and whine and bitch. I don't care. I think it is far more likely that we go sideways because there is no inf You don't have to sell a home when you have a 2.8% mortgage. The payment is that affordable. You can have a housing crash transaction and the transaction crash can get worse, which I am calling for. A 30% crash in prices because it's not fair. Keep, keep dreaming. And let, I guess I'll close with this. 
I would like nothing more than a 30% housing crash in prices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would love it. It's just not coming guys. I don't know what, I don't know what you're smoking, but life's not fair. I'm sorry. And they are smoking a drug called hopium. And oh, it's hopium. Yes. <laughs> it's killing. It's, it's a lot of, a lot of wannabe investors or home buyers are overdosing left and right. So, <laughs> there you go. so speaking of how, to invest in a sideways market, to invest in a high interest rate market or a difficult market. You and I talked about seller financing last week in a couple of different videos. One of the comments on that, because we didn't cover this specific topic, was, okay, it seems easy enough to understand the terms and to understand the concept of seller financing. But Mike, uh, Kill Deuce 4423 he asks, can you speak on the back end? How does the buyer protect him or herself after the contract is signed? Ah, man, shame on us for not talking about that. So essentially what the seller becomes is the bank. And they get the same protection that a bank gets. And what is that? They get to record a note against the deed of trust, which creates a position and allows that lender the same rights that a bank does, aka they can floor close on you if you don't pay. So they have, and it's actually, uh, the note is an asset as well. I don't think we talked about that either. So not only is their security as good and equal to a bank, which it is, they also have an asset, the note that can be sold. If they put a note on a, I think you talked about a $28,000 building or whatever the heck you were buying, um, that asset can be sold. They could sell it for a discount. There are people that buy discounted notes. So that asset has value. And the last thing that we probably didn't talk about is what happens if the seller dies well, Mike, I'm sorry, you still owe the note. It will go into his estate and it will go yep. to one of his heirs. So uh, I think those are three topics that maybe we failed to mention last time that maybe, you know, just cover quickly here. Yeah, seller financing, there is a very powerful, very powerful option to do real estate investing. And it may seem a little bit scary, but I promise you somebody like Zuber who's done as many deals as he has or the deals that I've done, don't worry, you are protected. It's taken care of. It's a great strategy to learn about it. Okay. All right. Now there's a good question here. So uh, this one's from Guacho Don. He said, it's hard to expect inventory to continue to set record lows, but transactions continue to go up as rates drop. So it might get worse before it gets better. How bad would the economy have to be for interest rates to come back down to the one to 4% range? Mm -hmm. Is it still a year or two away or is it further than that? So, I don't believe in my investing lifetime, which I'll put it 30 more years, we will see sub 3% mortgages again. So that's a long time. I frankly think the chances of seeing sub 4% are equally unlikely, but I want to give myself a little wiggle room there just in case. I suspect mortgage rates for the next decade will average between five and a half and six and a half. Now to the question at hand, how bad? We would have to have a recession, no question. It would likely need to be multiple, uh, a long one, right? Not the average kind of six month one. We would probably need a black swan that we're not looking at. And oh, by the way, black swan that we're not looking at does not include banking or commercial real estate because we're already talking about those. It would have to be something else. World War III comes to mind. That would kind of suck. Mm -hmm. That might take rates really low. Yeah, World War III would take rates really low, I would imagine. Um, it would have to be something like that. So in short, I hope we don't see it. I hope rates just are boring. I hope they're like five and a half to six and a half for the next decade. I don't. I can't imagine rates being sub 4%. It would have to be something that none of us would like, I think. Right. Be grateful for the devil we do have instead of the devil we don't. <laughs> yeah, sometimes, dude, you got to be careful what you wish for. Yeah. Right? You got to, I mean, like, for example, careful what you wish for. How many investors have been begging for a slower market? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot. Congratulations. Then, you got a slower here. market. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. There's always going to be people who complain at any point. <laughs> mm -hmm. Amen. All right. So this week, uh, we've been trying to do like a comment of the week type thing, and I kind of have two. Awesome. That, are, that are that are tied right here. So the first one 
uh, right here was from Kenneth Glee, ATLGA. He says, the new legacy inheritance will be your when your parents leave you a 3% mortgage. <laughs> I have not seen that question. Yeah, uh, I, I, I think uh, back to kind of the first question we started with. The reason we had a crash last time is the debt was a liability. That's why the banks had to take it back. Reason to create a financing sub to innovation, you know, all, you know, assumptions are taking off now is because the debt's an asset. And he, and uh, this comment's absolutely right. If if you pass on and you give your debt to your heirs, um, that's an asset. I, I have said many times that if you have a rate below three percent, it's the best asset you're ever going to do. Think about that. I think there's a good chance that inflation averages two and a half for the next three thirty 30 years. If you borrowed 30 year money at two and a half, you won. I mean, it's crazy to think about. Yeah. Yeah. And and to the point you said earlier, you know, you may never see that 3% mortgage again in your investing lifetime, which, you know, they are going to eventually as they get paid off and people refinance or more people sell and buy, it's just going to get more and more rare. And with scarcity comes value when people sit there and go, you got a 3% mortgage from your parents that was formed 20 years ago. Wow. Wow. That's cooler than getting a Benz. That's for sure. There you go. All right. Comment of the week number two, and I know you're going to love this one. This one comes from Financial Ninja 3180. And he says, Peter Schiff has accurately predicted all 26 recessions in the last two decades. You owe him 26 nailed t shirts. <laughs> oh, yeah, Peter Schiff. Um, original crash, uh, it, bro. <laughs> original Doomer, for sure. Um, I will say that I watch his stuff because I want to get the other side. I believe this is my opinion. Unlike most crash bros and doomers, I believe that Peter Schiff believes what he's saying, which is important to me. I want to listen to people uh, that are smart or smarter than me that believe what they're saying. I don't want to listen to the frauds, the pretenders who have found a niche in doom that don't believe what they're saying. If you're preaching doom in housing and then you go buy a home, Yeah, so uh, I respect Peter Schiff. I think he's right. He's called 26 recessions out of the last three or whatever the number is. Uh, he is a perma bear, but I respect him enough to read what he talks about. Um, that's my personal opinion. Now, he is very entertaining. and I do enjoy watching his videos too. I just take them with a with a handful of salt, not just a grain. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Okay. Uh, so I don't know if you knew this, Mike, but you, Matt, and Dion are apparently a bunch of amateurs from uh, ESKAYP101, SKP101. This, the hypotheticals used in this discussion between you and the other three amigos is beyond amateurish. Rates don't move in a static environment. Any move in rates will be accompanied by a dynamic set of economic effects. There's no unlocking demand like a bunch of horses at the starting line. Wow. Um, I would ask you to go back and look at very recent history. Um, there's this thing called marginal demand. And marginal demand is unlocked. So I don't know what this, I, 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 I'm not even sure what this person is saying. Um, real estate, actually demand in general, which this individual doesn't get, in my opinion, is a two-step function. There's desire and ability. I'll say that again, desire and ability. What is happening now in the mortgage market with rates over 7% for the last four weeks and possibly a fifth week coming up is you've taken ability out of the equation, but the desire may still be there. If rates fall, the marginal buyer comes back, unlocks, and uh, is game changing. And we have several points in recent history to go look at that. So I believe this individual is wildly incorrect. I believe they are equating, I don't know, stuff they read on the internet from idiots because absolutely demands a two-step function. There's a physical want, need, or desire, and then the ability. And what's happening right now is the ability is being constrained and if rates fall, the ability is unlocked, and that's called marginal demand. So I don't know how to react to that. They're, I believe they're wrong. 
Well, I got offended on your behalf, Mike, because, you know, if somebody's <laughs> investing in real estate for 20 plus years, you know, came from the sales background for a big company like you did, and also has a degree in economics, if you're still considered an amateur, I don't know what makes an expert. Yeah, I appreciate that. All right. We got another question on seller financing. This one was about negotiating seller financing. Mm -hmm. and it's one of the most common questions there is. This one comes from Obi-Wan Kobe. I think that's a Star Wars reference, but they... Anyways, they say, the problem I have had with seller financing is not being able to negotiate directly with the seller. Having two realtors in between is very inefficient. Did you mostly find off-market deals for this? I think that's an excellent point. Because again, uh, it's, it's called the telephone game, right? You talk to your agent, agent talks to agent, agent talks to seller. And if you go that far, it's, it's not going to work. Um, I've done dozens maybe a dozen, not nah, probably 14 or so seller finance deals over the years. I think 70 to 80% were direct, meaning off market or a phone call. Somebody knew someone and I was always talking to the seller. The others, um, it was the listing agent that reached out to me. So I cannot recall a deal that I found online that I went through an agent, through another agent to the seller. That And, and I've tried it and I know I've tried it. I don't recall one being successful. It's just too hard. There's too many layers. There's yeah. too much confusion. Uh, so this, if you're if you're trying to write offers out of the MLS seller financing through your agent that then has to go through the listing agent, I have not been successful. I have been successful going direct to the listing agent. Listing agent is interesting because they have they have their their goal is to get a deal done. That's right for the buyer and the seller. So if you find an agent that's willing to articulate, and again, when the listing agent called me, they didn't play telephone game. They said, let's go to lunch. I'll bring the seller. Great. Let's have that's a right. conversation. So uh, if you can't do it, you know, first face-to-face, -face, maybe a conference call or a Zoom call. But yeah, I have to talk to the seller. I have to figure out where their objections lie or their misunderstandings lie. Some people think it's illegal. And by some people, I mean real estate agents. And it's just absolutely not. So yeah, it's it's tough. If you're going through an agent, multiple agents, I have never been successful. I'm sure it happens, but I haven't done it. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. It's so much easier to deal directly with a seller or at least only one person. One agent, between. yeah. All right, last question. And this is about the jobs reports being revised. So this one comes from John Gilbert, 6003. He says, every jobs report has been revised to the downside in 2023. Why are they always revised down? Is this political? Are they trying to inflate numbers to look good? What's the reason? So again, I've been lucky enough to study this for 20 years. And I think what you're seeing, in the, so first off, I am not one who believes in conspiracy theories. I don't think this is some conspiracy to make Biden look good. I don't, I don't personally think that I don't, I, yeah, anyway, I'm not going down that avenue. So I don't think that's happening. What's happening with the jobs numbers. I think our economy is structurally changing and our Bureau of Labor and Statistics is not changing as quickly. So if you're using a model that's worked for 30 years and over the last four years, our economy, our side hustles, our ability to make income, our, work from home, all of these things are changing, it's going to blow up the models. So I frankly think the fact that they're bringing in month significant monthly adjustments is admitting the models are broken. And these models will get better over time. Um, I've, I, I haven't looked at their recent models, but I actually studied the models 30 years ago, 20 years ago. We looked at them. We broke them down. And um, the models are, are, again, historically speaking, rather um, defined, right? They take a bunch of inputs and then at the end, there's a, a number that spits out and that's what's reported. These numbers are not opinions. They're not opinions. They're not, oh, he's a Democrat. Let's make him look better. They're not opinions. I just think the underlying economy is different than what the models were built and they'll be changed. There, I There's a bunch of PhDs that are embarrassed by the amount of revisions. So I think the economy is fundamentally different and their models are broken. I don't think it's political in nature. In fact, I think when you have these kinds of revisions, it makes them look bad. 
Um, so that's my thoughts on that. Yeah, I think it's a good question to end on because, you know, I mean, I, I can't say that I don't there that I disagree with the commenter because, you know, when you sit there and say, OK, well, how come it's always revised down? How come they always get it wrong in one direction? Kind of makes sense that you think something shady is going on. But when you explain sure. it that, hey, the economy shifted from the where it was when those models were built. So it's consistently wrong until it gets fixed. And I'm sure it's not something as easy as oh, you click a button and fix it. You probably oh. have to totally go back to the drawing board and readjust a lot. Oh, yeah. They're, I mean, these models are rather sophisticated. And again, the, the, what I believe is happening is our economy is structurally built different today than four years ago. Models don't change that fast. Inputs don't change that fast. And uh, it will probably take another year or 18 months for the PhDs to figure out, wow, the U.S. economy is different. And um, I think we should get used to negative revisions. Interesting. Interesting. Well, Mike, those are all the questions that I had for you this week. Appreciate you for having me on. No, we appreciate you, Mike. You do this every week for us. It's uh, something you don't have to do, but near as I can tell you enjoy doing it. Uh, so I appreciate you. Where can people find you? Yeah. If you just go on uh, Instagram or YouTube and type in millennial Mike, you'll find me lounging about. There you go, brother. Take care of yourself. Thanks again. See ya.